usually once we get up at the project location, which in this case was Rise Norton Air Base in England, uh, we would have the intelligence people from the American Air Force would come in and they would tell us about the mission about Oh, a day or two before, usually two days. And then we'd get all the maps. And as a navigator, I'd have to draw the route of the mission and, uh, and prepare the airplane as well as the pilots, checking it over, making sure it was okay. And then the day of the mission, we'd actually go out and spend about three hours going through the airplane and checking it out, pre-flighting it, as they call it. And uh, then once we're satisfied, the airplane is ready to go, then we launched. But it was uh, yeah, quite a bit of mission preparation. But there wasn't, uh, for us, there wasn't a lot of advanced planning. And of course, we in no way had a uh, privilege of selecting the route or where it went or anything like that. That was all done, I'm sure, by Strategic Air Command headquarters in Omaha. So that's pretty well the way it worked. Now after the mission was over, we'd come back and they would have a call debrief. And if we anything unusual happened during the mission, like being intercepted, by an airplane or having something new that came up from our electronic countermeasures, whether it was radio signals or radars or whatever it was that we picked up, then of course they want to know about that right away. So, uh, so we had the debriefing afterwards and then we were free until we were called to go on the next mission. Well, the year before, I flew in uh, missions out of Inshalik, Turkey, up into the Black Sea, and then I flew over Iraq and Iran, which was the Shah at that time. So we flew the southern border of the Soviet Union. And then after a couple of months, uh, we went to Prize Norton in England, and then we flew uh, missions along the uh, east-west German border. And uh, again, at no time did we ever come close of uh, crossing their border. So it was, uh, we call it routine training missions. At that time, Strategic Air Command had what they call an integrated crew. So all six of us stayed on the same crew. If somebody got sick or something happened to one of the crew members, then they'd send the whole crew home and they'd bring in another whole crew because we were so used to working together and we knew each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses that was important for us to stay together as a crew. Now, the only change would come when you'd go home and uh, we'd be home maybe six to nine months. During that time, if one of the crew members left, like a co-pilot left from our crew in 59, uh, he got out of the service. Um, that's when Olmstead came aboard in 1960. And uh, he was a new member. And then our electronic warfare officer, number one, he left to uh, go on another crew. And then we got a new electronic warfare officer, number one. So, but we trained with that crew after we got them for several months before we were actually called an integrated crew. And then we were released to go overseas. Oh, it was just like a lot of other mornings before I got up to fly a mission. It wasn't anything unusual. We were 
sent on this mission on the 1st of July, 1960, to uh, check out what was going on in the Barents Sea area. Now that's north. Uh, we were flying north of Murmansk in this big sea. It's part of the Arctic Ocean. And uh, we had heard that there were rumors that they were test firing uh, their version of the Polaris uh, submarine missile. And uh, so we were interested in finding out if we could gain information off that. Plus the fact that it was a big target area for SAC in case we ever went to war. So we wanted to check the defenses along that northern coast, which we did. And as we came down towards the uh, turning point uh, at the mouth of the White Sea, flying parallel to the coast, uh, we, were we were just starting a procedural turn to, because the coast comes up this way, to uh, stay out in international waters. Uh, the aircraft commander saw this fighter right off her right wing. Um, he said it couldn't have been more than 60 feet away. So it was very close. <clears throat> we didn't get any signals from the fighter and uh, had red stars. The pilots knew it was a uh, MiG from the Soviets. And we started a procedure turn, and according to Homestead, the fighter came down below behind us and without any warning started pumping cannon shells in our airplane. Uh, number two and three engine caught fire, seized 90 degrees to, to the airstream, threw us in a flat spin to the left. And uh, uh, According to the engineers, when the engines would seize like that, they were supposed to fall off the pylon, come up over the wing, and fall off the airplane. Why well, they didn't. And uh, so we lost about 2,000 feet in altitude, and then we level off. Both pilots were riding f full right rudder, so that trying to correct just turn to the left. And then I heard the aircraft commander say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then we had a second burst of fire that came through my compartment. And I saw holes about this big around in the uh, compartment. Um, <clears throat> then I saw a fire coming down the aisle between me and the pilots and the aircraft commander said bail out, bail out, bail out on the alarm bell. I heard a couple explosions behind me, which sounded like the canopy and an ejection seat. And I decided, time for me to get out of there. So I pulled my uh, D-ring and I went down seven negative Gs. They went 14 positive Gs up to clear the vertical stabilizer of the airplane. <clears throat> so when I hit the airstream at 600 miles an hour, my helmet and mask blew off my face, and uh, I lost consciousness for just a few uh, seconds, and then I was free falling. And I remember that. You see a skydiver with his arms and legs out. That's what I was like, and I free fell all the way down to. 13,000 feet from 28. And then uh, my chute opened automatically. And then uh, I uh, saw a big fire on the water, a bunch of papers and float in the air. And so I chute about a half mile below me at about 2,000 feet. Looked like the aircraft commander, but he was not moving in his chute. The second guy was moving, he uh, uh, unhooked his life raft and survival kit 
and uh, both of them I saw went in the water. Now, I'm from Kansas, and I wasn't used to the ocean. And I had a number, nylon summer flying suit, T-shirt, shorts, jumpers, and socks. And uh, <clears throat> I had heard from the intelligence officer that uh, that water was 33 degree Fahrenheit, one degree above freezing. And you could last 18 minutes dressed as we were in that water. And then I noticed the water had a white sheen on it. That was because there was a 50 mile an hour surface wind blowing on the water. And uh, <clears throat> so I got close to the water. I unbuckled my chute, hung in so I could throw the harnesses away because I could see that we were going to have a pretty good wind. And uh, I had my dinghy inflated automatically and my survival kit hanging down below me. They went in and I went in about 20 feet into the water. Came back up, reached out, and there was a lanyard to my dinghy. So I just worked my way up very gingerly and got in it. And that's when I found out that the sea swells were 12 to 15 feet high. And every once in a while, a particularly big one would turn me over, get back in the water, get back in the dinghy. The dinghy was so small, all you could do was sit in it like this. And uh, I didn't see Olmstead only a couple of times. I never saw uh, the first guy uh, get into a dinghy or anything. I just assumed he went on into the water. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the three guys, I'm pretty sure, went in with the airplane. I don't think they ever got out because they were surrounded by fuel cells. There was one behind them, one above them, and one in front of them. So if one of those shells hit one of those fuel cells, it would blow up. They'd have a fire. That would be the end of them. Anyway, <clears throat> I became a dinghy rider. Uh, started praying a lot. It's cold. And uh, after about three hours, I kept looking at my watch. It's one hour, two hours, and I was still alive. And I said, well, maybe I'll make it a, out of all this. I never really had a feeling of committing suicide. Uh, I guess I'm too strong for that. But uh, I was saying a lot of prayers, and of course, most of them were pretty selfish and didn't see any help much. And after about four, four and a half hours, I started saying prayers like, Oh, God, uh, forgive me for my sins. Please take care of my wife and three children at home. And I said, uh, please, uh, I'm in your hands. And again, thank you for all you've done for me. And all of a sudden, there's this bright light right off the end of the dinghy. And it was so bright I couldn't see it. You look at it. I had to shield it with my hands. And uh, I could see the sun. The sun was up 24 hours a day north of the Arctic Circle. And we were several hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle. But uh, I couldn't look at that light. And I knew that was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was there and I said, uh, thank you, Lord, for being with me. And I was, was there for about 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, I started feeling warmer physically. Uh, I knew everything would be all right and not to worry. And within an hour, there comes this little dot on the horizon, and there comes a the trawler. So I looked for 
my signaling devices. Somebody had forgotten to put in the flares. I didn't even have pen light flares in my May West. Had no C marker die. Somebody forgot to put that in. I uh, had uh, uh, no whistle, no flashlight, nothing. Um, I did put in a radio, but the radio was separate from the battery. So I had to connect up the battery to the radio. And these big sea swells kept coming over. And as soon as I took the cap off the battery, the sea swell came. And that was the end of the battery. <clears throat> Salt water didn't work very good with electricity. Anyway, uh, I did find a mirror. And they said on a clear day, you can see the mirror 25 miles away. Well, I could see the mirror reflecting off the side of that ship. It was a big ship. It was a uh, trawler, fishing trawler that they used. And they never saw it. They kept getting closer and closer and closer. And how I got rescued was I started to holler, here I am, here I am. And all of a sudden, they put it out there. There he is. They put a rule book. Came out and got me. That's how I got rescued. Talk about a miracle. You betcha. Anyway, I was taken aboard and given this Russian Air Force uniform. And then I said, keep looking. There may be five, five more out there. And uh, they spoke kind of a pig, pigeon English. And, they spoke a pigeon, Russian. And they uh, came in after about 30 minutes. Said, we have one more, one more. That's when they picked up Bruce Olmsted. And then we were taken off the boat after searching for about, I guess it was a good six to 12 hours. After going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then finally, we steamed a port and that was another 12 hours. And they uh, let us all on a little speedboat on the uh, side of the ship away from land so we couldn't see. And there was about half a dozen Russian sailors with AK-47. They didn't look very happy. And uh, they closed the curtains on the speedboat. We took off for about a couple more hours then they let us off at an isolated dock on the northern coast of Russia. Um, I say isolated. It was four or five uh, tuba twelves on top of four different pilings. And that was it. So we waited for our Land Rover vehicle. It came. And took us to an isolated airstrip, and uh, the airstrip still had the old PSP that we gave them in World War II for their landing strips, for their dirt landing strips, metal type stuff that you put on the ground, made it more firm for aircraft operation. We did DC, DC-3, Cooney Bird came in, C-47. American gave them that too, and uh, picked us up. Had seats in it, and everything was nice, like it was used for transporting VIP Russians. And uh, flew us into Moscow, got us off, put us in the Black Mariah. Black Mariah is what the KGB used to transport prisoners. It was a black vehicle with a big steel case in the back and had three isolated cells on each side of the walkway. And then towards the front, you had a bar cell where you could put three or four or five people. We were given the isolated cells where you had to sit down and spread your feet apart on a hard wooden bench, and then we hit the 
cobblestone streets of Moscow, 35 and 40 miles an hour, and the Olmstead had a broken back. He never let out a whimper. And uh, they let him off first, and then drove me around, I think just to disorient me, and then uh, let me out. They uh, uh, took my Russian Air Force uniform, gave me a black prison shirt and pants and shoes, no shoelaces, no belt, and uh, took me up to Bianca. That's where I stayed. The interrogations would be involved with my family, my father, what he did for a living, my mother, what she did, uh, my brother. Uh, we go into family history. When I first got there, of course, it was all about the shoot down and that we had crossed the border uh, and that's why we were shot down. And we kept uh, giving him name, rank, service number, and date of birth for about, I think it was about three weeks for me, uh, air interrogation, name, rank, service number, date of birth. I always saluted when I came in to the interrogation. And then when it was over, I always saluted when I left. And they said, you don't have to do that, John. You're here in civilian status. Like they wouldn't recognize my military, uh, my military background. Um, in the morning, we would have maybe a tablespoon or two of rice, and you'd have to take a tablespoon, which is the only utensil we had, and you'd take the spoon and separate the sticks and the stones and the glass and uh, wood and all the other pieces and put them on one pile and then the rice in the other. And of course, since it was so dirty, we got diarrhea a lot from the food. And then at lunch, we'd have a bowl of borscht, they call it, but it wasn't borscht, it was more like dishwater. And it was kind of a pink with a little skim of uh, grease on top and a piece of black bread, which was very small. And then you eat that and then you had a cup of coffee, no tea, no uh, sugar, no uh, cream or anything, just black coffee and grounds on the bottom for the cup about that thick. And then at night, might have a couple of tablespoons of boiled macaroni, and that was it, just macaroni, a tablespoon or two of that, and then another piece of black bread, and then some hot tea, and that was it. That was the diet that we had for about, oh, three to four months, and so I lost about 70 pounds, and Bruce lost about the same amount during a period of time. <clears throat> so it was a pretty tough diet. As we came up closer to our release, I remember eating a tablespoon of Epicurean peas uh, with, a, with some uh, cream in them, which was a real treat. Only had it once. Um, <clears throat> once I had a chocolate covered ice cream bar when I came back from one of my interrogations. I don't know why, but they gave me that. Uh, never had any more of those. So uh, the food did improve uh, within about a month before release. We had more of everything, and uh, I guess they're trying to fatten us up a little bit before we were released. But that was uh, one of the big things. And of course, the other thing was you lost a lot of sleep because when you're interrogated 
four and five hours of stretch with an hour break. Four and five hours of stretch with an hour break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You lost a lot of sleep. And then when you did get back to the cell, you'd have to lie on your back facing the light. The light was in the ceiling about 20 feet high. It was in a 300 watt clear bulb. So when you close your eyelids, it was so strong, you could see it burning through your eyelids. So you lost a lot of sleep there. After several months of that, then they'd come in and they'd turn on, off and on the switch to the light from the outside the cell just to disorient you. And then when you got used to that, they turn it off completely and you're in total blackness because there is no cell bars on the cell door. It was a solid wooden door. So when they shut the door, you couldn't hear or see anything outside. And uh, it was almost a soundproof cell. So it was pretty tough. I never saw anybody else and, uh, behind those wooden doors. They couldn't see out of the cell. So the only time you knew somebody was outside your cell door was when uh, they would open up what they call a little Judas hole and then look in on you. You see the eyeball looking. And uh, uh, the reason you couldn't hear, even though they had hobnail boots, uh, they had carpeting outside in front of the cell doors so that you couldn't hear anything. Um, the only time we saw each other coming out of ourselves was the morning of our release. And for seven months, I didn't know where Olmstead was. And he was four cells down from me. He didn't know where I was. Uh, very interesting. We would re receive books like um, some from Theodore Dreiser and, and uh, progressive writers like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first was offered a book, they had Face to Face with America by Khrushchev, and it was pure propaganda. And I said, I don't want to read any of that stuff. And uh, so we were settled on things like Mark Twain and Dreiser and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of books, which was nice. And I suspect they came out of my uh, uh, interpreter's library, or he got them out of the state library, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, it was interesting. I kept asking for a Bible, and I never got one. But uh, Bruce got himself a Bible by saying to him that uh, they got him in a corner about his father, who was not too well. And um, he said, uh, uh, they kept trying to say, well, Bruce, if you give any information we want, says, we'll give you the Bible. And he says, ah, he says, by that time, we were writing home a letter about every two weeks. Of course, it was highly censored. We'd write it, and then we'd have to rewrite it, and then we'd rewrite it, or we'd rewrite it maybe a dozen times. And then the letters we got of home, they would scratch out stuff on the letter that they didn't want us to read. Um, but he said, the next time I write to my dad, I'm going to tell him. They're using that the Bible as a bribe. Oh, no, we're not doing that. The next day, he, in his, in his uh, cell, he found a Douay version of the Bible in English on his bed. And that's how he got his Bible. But you do get to know these people, uh, particularly your interrogator and your uh, interpreter. Um, I knew that they were KGB agents. 
since we were in the KGB prison, uh, my interrogator was a captain in the KGB, uh, and the uh, interpreter was a KGB agent from their foreign office. And uh, they were both very good, but uh, and they didn't mistreat me. But uh, again, uh, while I uh, understood what they were trying to do, I didn't feel like there was any love lost between us. Um, I kind of held them at an arm's length. Um, they, uh, of course, tried the interrogation technique of uh, being friendly because they always called me John. Um, even though I would come in and salute them and say, Lieutenant McCone coming in for interrogation, sir, you don't have to do that. Yes, I do. I'm an American military officer. And I always did it. Um, the uh, I had the feeling that if things went against me, they'd be the first ones that would throw me in the pit. So I would uh, always be very careful and uh, try to uh, be as honest as I could. And most importantly, remember even several months ago when I was there, what I'd said before because if I changed my story, they would pounce on that like a bunch of bees on honey. And uh, then I'd have to explain why the difference is between my story. Now sometimes that works to your advantage because uh, then you can uh, use that as a time uh, waster and uh, waste a lot of time trying to get them straighten out the stories. So it was kind of fun in that way. Uh, so it was fun. It was a pretty deadly game. Like my life was at stake, you know. So uh, yeah, it was a time where, yeah, you got pretty close to the interrogation team. But again, you never lost track of where they were coming from. And of course, they had a lot of pressure uh, from their higher ups trying to get a confession out of me and trying to get me ready to go, quote, to trial, which we never did. And uh, that was the whole pretext of all this. This was the investigation. Once the investigation is over, then you meet a lawyer, according to Soviet law. And then the lawyers there just to mitigate any possible sentence the court may give you. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, no, we never saw a lawyer, although we asked to see one, asked to see the American ambassador, the American air attache, and all these people, and we never saw anybody. Nobody from the International Red Cross, anything like that either. So we were there by our lonesomes. Well, when we were there in um, September, we uh, had uh, access to uh, the transcript of the Francis Gary Powers trial, which was in August. And uh, they published a slick uh, uh, booklet on the uh, trial, had pictures and so forth, and uh, the uh, prosecutor was uh, Roman Rodinko, who was the prosecutor general of the Soviet Union. And uh, he was also major general in rank. And... Uh, the top prosecutor, and uh, 
we were continually told by our interrogators that uh, we would be going to trial. So, one of the steps in Soviet law was that you'd be interviewed by the, we call him persecutor, by the prosecutor before we went to trial. One of the purposes of this was to find out if you had any regrets and you were sorry for what you did. So uh, finally in October, about mid-October, I was called up for this interrogation and I was taken to a completely different part of the Lubyanka. It's very nice area, uh, broad uh, walkways, carpet on the floor, and uh, was ushered in this huge office. And here's this guy sitting behind the desk with this big picture window behind him and showed the might of Moscow and all the smokestacks and everything behind him. So it was quite an impressive view. And uh, I was accompanied by my interpreter and interrogator and sat down at this desk with a green cover on the top, top of the desk. Uh, when you put a piece of white paper on the green cover, it means that this is important business psychologically. So uh, he started interrogating me and, and uh, asked me if I was guilty of the crimes against the Soviet Union that I was charged with. And there were about two legal sized pieces of paper of different charges that were brought against us. Uh, they were ridiculous as charges from, uh, uh, we were members of the uh, Strategic Air Command uh, of the warmongering camp, as they call it. And that was two years of hard labor in uh, Siberia just by itself, if they proved that. But it went all the way down, different charges of uh, finally that we had crossed the Soviet Sea Air border for the purposes of espionage and even in peacetime, that was death by shooting if I was found guilty by the Soviets. So <clears throat> we went through the charges and I said, not guilty to all of them. And he said, uh, well, he says, do you, you uh, condemn your leaders? And I said, no, I don't condemn my leaders. I said, uh, uh, and he got pretty, pretty upset. He says, do you condemn these flights? I said, no, I don't condemn the flights. I said, I participated freely in the flights. He says, do you condemn your country? I said, no sending you on these flights. I says, why should I condemn my country? I said, I was doing my job like any military man. And uh, he was getting pretty upset by this time. He was getting red in the face and everything. And finally, he says, do you have any regrets? And when I heard that, I remembered Nathan Hale the American spy that was caught by the British as a spy in the Revolutionary War. And he was asked the same question by the British. And Nathan Hale's response was, I regret only that I have but one life to give for my country. And then they hung him. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if that's good enough for Nathan Hale, that's good enough for John McCone. And that's what I told this guy. And man, he just went, pow, ballistic. Came out of the desk, hit his fist on the desk, says, get him out of here. And that's the last time I saw him.
And I guess Bruce got him upset. Bruce said when he called him the persecutor general of the Soviet Union, he just phew, went ballistic here. So we felt like we left a definite impression with him. But one of our interpreters in September had a coronary and died. And General Plekhayev, one of the uh, head of the section that was conducting the investigation, had a coronary and died in December. So we felt like we left a definite impression on, on those people. Um, we continually ask to see each other on Christmas or Christmas Eve, and we were finally allowed to see each other. As for the second time, the first time was in September. We had a joint interrogation and got them arguing among themselves so much that we got to talk to each other under our breath in whispers. I found out the other guy was doing as well as he could. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but after that, we didn't see each other until Christmas Eve. And I was given a pair of, two pairs of socks and a uh, sweatshirt. And I think he, he was given a couple pairs of socks and uh, maybe a jacket or something. But anyway, when we saw each other, I gave him one of my pair of socks. He gave me one of his pair of socks. But after we got out and we were at the embassy, they said there were mailbags full of stuff that went over to the prison for us. They had cans of fruit cans of peanuts, candy, all kinds of stuff. The commissars, uh, they said, the commissars told them they kept all that because they were afraid they might be poisoned. <clears throat> so I'm sure the commissars had a very nice Christmas. And another interesting thing was that <clears throat> there was a lot of clothes, and that's all the clothes we got. So somebody else kept all the clothes. Uh, there were books and magazines. In fact, a Christmas issue of Playboy, which they kept. <laughs> <clears throat> Interesting bunch, yeah. Well, it was just before we were released, and I guess it was something to do. And, so they felt like we weren't going to try to escape or anything. So I was taken for a little tour of uh, Moscow and dead of winter. It's colder in blazes, you know. And uh, we would go so far and they'd get out and uh, that's uh, the Moscow River. Isn't it pretty? And it was all frozen over. Then we go in front of another building, that's the university, and, and that type of thing. And we made four or five stops, got back in the car, and mm -hmm. went back to the prison. And that was it. So it was kind of a nice thing to do, but uh, you know, still in solitary. Of course, towards the end, the interrogations dribbled down to about one every other day, and it was mainly just to get together and kind of stretch things out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, negotiations were going on, and, and we didn't know that, but uh, we knew in the back of our minds something was going on mm -hmm. because the heat all of a sudden was off. Anyway, <clears throat> I had laughed. When we were finally released, as we came out of our cells in the Lubyanka, the KGB guards all clicked their heels together, saluted, and uh, tears were coming out of their eyes because uh, we were being released. So it was kind of payback time for me to maintain my uh, military bearing. Uh, 
at all times, which I did. I'm happy to be able to announce that Captain Freeman B. Olmsted and Captain John R. McCone, members of the crew of the United States Air Force RB-47 aircraft, who have been detained by Soviet authorities since July 1st, 1960, have been released by the Soviet government and are now en route to the United States. The United States government is gratified by this decision of the Soviet Union and considers that this action of the Soviet government removes a serious obstacle to improvement of Soviet-American relations. Our deepest sympathy and understanding goes to the families of the men of the RB-47 who gave their lives in the service of their country. At the same time, I am sure that all Americans join me in rejoicing with the Olmsted and McCone families. The families, as well as the men, comported themselves in these trying times in a way which is truly in the best traditions of the military services of the United States. Restraint in these conditions is obviously not easy, but they can be assured that they have contributed in large measure to the final achievement of the objective which we all sought, the release of the men. Uh, it was great meeting President Kennedy. We didn't even know that he was elected to the office until release. We didn't know what happened in the United States. Uh, as uh, we flew into Washington, they said they had a terrible snowstorm, so we had to stop at Goose Bay, Labrador. Thank goodness, because all we had on were these Russian clothes. Uh, terrible haircuts. Uh, so we stopped at Goose Bay, which was an Air Force station. Had the basic change there, and the people at the exchange threw open the doors, got a new uniform, and uh, they donated that to us. And they, what they did, the people in the Air Force passed the hat and collected the money so we could get the uniforms. So, had Air Force physicals and uh, had a good night's sleep. The next day we were flown to Washington probably one of the worst winter days I ever saw. And uh, got off the old combine, and there was the president. And uh, he grabbed a hold of my arm, and he says, you don't want to talk to me. Here's your wife. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, they said that was the longest recorded kiss on television. And then um, he said, oh, by the way, come up to the, come up to the house this afternoon, and so I thought of the White House, mm -hmm. and so we were taken, and uh, had a chance to clean up. And then that afternoon, had a tea in the White House. I guess one of the uh, top honors I ever got was the President of the United States coming down the steps of the White House, opening the car door for me. Air Force captain at that time and ushered me into the White House. I thought that was pretty neat. And uh, he introduced me around. I thought he was still a senator. It was Vice President Johnson, uh, Air Force Secretary Eugene Zucker. Um, I didn't. Uh, know him. Uh, and then he told us in a private conversation, he took us, the two of us, together and he said, we still have somebody over there. And he says, we'd love to uh, give you the Medal of Honor for what you did. But he said, we can't do it because we agreed to the Soviets that there'd be no uh, publicity given over this release. Mm -hmm. And I want to stay with those agreements. So we said, oh, yeah, we understood. So <clears throat> we uh, uh, said, what are the other conditions? Because we didn't know. 
And he says, well, there'll be no more U-2 over flights over Soviet territory. Well, we already, I guess, agreed to that because we had satellites up by that time. So they were doing the same job. <clears throat> the second thing was that this release would not set off a propaganda campaign against the USSR. Therefore, no awards or anything else. The guy that shot us down in a public ceremony in the Kremlin on the 4th of July got the equivalent of the Air Force Cross by Khrushchev. <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> it was... Uh, it was quite a, quite a deal, and uh, we uh, abided by the agreement, the cancel New York City ticker tape parade, even cancel out a homecoming at our home base in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, but 44 years later, after the Soviet Union fell, and 2004, Bruce and I received the Silver Star for what we did by the Air Force Chief of Staff and the Secretary of the Air Force at the Air Force uh, Association meeting in Washington, D.C. So I guess we felt like it was worth it. At least we were still alive to receive the awards. <coughs> But anyway, that was the award that we received. Uh, of course, we were out of the uh, Air Force 25 years at that point. But uh, that's all right. Uh, at least the recognition happened. Mm -hmm. Well, I have mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. um, I can't put myself in his shoes. Um, he was on an entirely different mission. He was overflying Soviet airspace, and he was a member of the CIA, a uh, different organization, although he was a former Air Force pilot. Um, he uh, was, of course, by himself. Uh, it was up to him to uh, conduct himself as uh, he saw fit, and he did. Personally, I don't think I would conduct myself the same way, but that's the difference between us. And uh, so uh, I think that that's probably the best way I can put it. That's hard to say. Um, I know that when we were picked up in the trawler, uh, we were way out to sea. And uh, they had no idea I don't think about where we were or what happened. They just knew that they were out there to pick up whatever they could find from an airplane that they shot down and to see if they could find some survivors. Um, I know they picked up some papers they found that blew out of the cockpit. Uh, of course, they picked up Bruce and me, which I'm grateful for. And uh, they were not uh, belligerent, uh, uh, but they uh, were uh, helpful when I got aboard. Uh, gave me warm clothes and uh, some soup. The soup was, uh, had a fish head in it. So I knew it was fish soup and a skim of grease. 
And uh, when I tried to eat it, I chucked up because I was already sick with uh, being in the water so long and, and uh, had seasickness anyway. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, uh, the treatment on the trawler was good and uh, I was surprised that the clothes they gave me fit me exactly. The uh, shirt fit just right with the length of the sleeves and the collar and the pants were the right length, the right waist. It was a Russian Air Force uniform, blue uniform and a red star on the hat. And uh, so they uh, had it all ready, to, just like waiting for me. When we got back and things settled down, and people were trying to get to the point of writing the story. One of the authors at that time that wanted to write was Wayne Bradford Huey. Well, he was kind of a sensational writer. And, uh, his visualization was to have a book cover with this half-naked Russian jailer with a whip in her hand and the blood coming out of her back to sell the books. We said, no, no, we don't want any of that. So we settled on Bill White, and I think he wrote a magnificent book. It took him a year to uh, research it, and uh, then he spent three months. He lived in the officers' club at uh, Forbes Air Force Base and got to fly on a KC-97 and got to see the refueling of a B-47. Wow. And then he got to fly in the B-47 to see what the refueling was like. In those days, the KC-97, I got a full-blown picture in the den. But uh, when we refueled, we refueled at 15,000 feet, which was low for us. And so here's this four-engine propeller-driven KC-97 that was built for passenger air travel, not air refueling, mm -hmm. flying as fast as it could and a slight dive so it could go as fast as it could and trying to hook up with this jet reconnaissance airplane that was just going as slow as it could, mm -hmm. kind of wobbling, trying to get fuel off of this the KC-97. That was a real thrill, I tell you. On that particular day, we refueled with a new jet airplane. It was a KC-97, a four-jet airplane that was built to be a jet tanker. And we refueled at 30,000 feet going at our normal speed. And it was a piece of cake. Wow. Different between night and day. Because in the KC-97, We'd have to descend all the way down to 15, get the fuel, had to go back up to 30, 30 or so, wow. you know. And, and this way, man, just two right along, and, and it was, it was a joy. I know one thing. When I got home, I looked up at the guy, I packed my parachute, I gave him a twenty-dollar bill. <laughs> uh, Oh, he was uh, pretty nervous, and uh, he avoided eye contact as much as he could. Mm -hmm. And I knew the guy was lying, but uh, there was a lieutenant colonel interrogator that came in on this deal, and uh, he said, uh, <clears throat> How did you know uh, accused McCone uh, where you were located 
as a navigator uh, at the time of the shoot down. And I told him, I said, I had the radar on and I took a range and bearing fix off the Holy Nose Cape and a range and bearing fix off the Cannon Nose Cape. And I said, they crossed right there at the turning point. There was no question in my mind where we were. Mm -hmm. And he says, okay. And he says to the fighter pilot, he says, how do you know that these people were in our 12 mile territory limit? That was 64 miles out to sea. And he said, uh, did you receive any radio transmissions from your ground stations telling you to, uh, that they had crossed the border and to shoot them down? And he says, no, he says, at that time, I had static on my radios. And I didn't receive any transmissions. And he says, well, how do you know how to shoot them down? And he says, well, I saw them visually cross our border, and I took it on myself to shoot the intruder down. And the colonel looked at him, looked at me, and he says, that's the end of the interrogation. So that was that. Yeah. Now Bruce uh, was back in the, uh, Russia after the revolution, back in the 90s. So Bruce took a trip back and uh, he was asked if he wanted to meet the fighter pilot. The fighter pilot wanted to see him. And Bruce said, no, I don't want to see him. The fighter pilot wanted to see Bruce? Yeah. Oh. And Bruce said, no. I don't want to see him. And I'd feel the same way. I wouldn't want to see that guy. I'm afraid I'd get a little violent. <clears throat> I killed four of my good friends. <clears throat> yeah, I'll tell you. 